Yeah. Ready? Ready? Yeah, we're ready. Let's go. Let's go. Sorry for the delay. Oh, I'm great, young. Hey! I would put a big long history up here because my history is, is I'm an end user. <laughs> They hack together an occasional little bit of C code to keep things going. But I started initially teaching myself C. And I did that four, five, maybe six years ago. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what people who either have programming skills or would like to have programming skills uh, can do to try to move <coughs> Ecom Station and its support software world. First thing that I want to point out is when you choose a program, when you when you get started in this, choose something that you want to do, something that's important to you. I started with FM2 because that's the file manager I've used for oh, 16 years, probably when I first started working on it. You've got a bunch of choices. You've got bunch of orphan programs out there. You've got some projects that are under development. There are still a handful of commercial and shareware things. Um, PM Mail is a good example of that type of stuff. A lot of stuff is coming from porting. And obviously you could do a program from scratch, something that doesn't exist out there. Probably the most common time that happens is when somebody's trying to replace an OS2 component. New view comes to mind. Large number of candidates. Um, GitHub OS2 has over a thousand repositories. I think it was a thousand eighty-seven. It's the yeah. last time that I looked. <clears throat> a couple things to do if you go out there. Check to see if that program is being developed and is somewhere else at the same time. FM2 is the one that comes to, or FTE is the one that comes to mind. It's an editor. Well, EFTE, which I'm developing, is quite a bit advanced from that. And it's actually up on NetLabs. And you probably didn't even know the two were the same program. <laughs> but you want to do a little research because oftentimes you can get into a development situation where you're essentially reinventing something that someone else has already done a lot of work on. Now, the NetLabs program, programs tend to be active. I won't say they all are. We probably do a lesser extent now than we were at one point. Um, the first thing you want to do is just communicate with the development team. Most of the OS2 developers are going to be happy to get help. Now, you will find exceptions to that, but... Yeah, I can get grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to consider what you getting help means. It means, here, you can do this. <laughs> um, but the real advantage to, to finding a project that already has a team working on it Particularly if you're not that familiar with either OS2 programming or programming in general, is the other people on it will help you. They'll critique your code, they'll tell you, you know, they'll eventually tell you how to write that <coughs> section of code after you've tried 60 times and not gotten it quite, quite right. <laughs> now, commercial and shareware is still possible. PM mail is the example that comes to mind. Um, if you really wanted to, I'm sure Neil would let you sign a yeah, non-disclosure non agreement and give you access to that code. I have access to it. Steve has access to it. Probably other people in this room do. That, <clears throat> so that we can work on or attempt to fix or at least help with tracking down where some of the bugs might If you're going to go out and find somebody who has a shareware program or commercial software where the development has just stopped and you want them to open source it, you want to be careful about how that gets done. 
you want to make sure that they, it gets licensed in a way that you can use it. Um, particularly if you're planning on combining it with something. Because uh, the Mozilla license, one, five, or lower, you can't use with GPL. At least you can't legally use with GPL. I'm sure that it's happened. <coughs> But, and there's other <coughs> cases like that, so that if you are going to go to all the trouble to get somebody to put something out as open source, make sure it gets licensed in such a way that it, we can get maximum utility out of it. Porting. The real advantage to port. Can I interrupt one? Sure. Thing? Wait, there are licenses that you consider that are not good, open source licenses? that gives you problems? There are open source licenses, like the example I gave yeah. They're not that, that you can't use another license with it. There are two open source licenses, but you can't mix the code from the two projects <laughs> is the one example. There also are licenses that are more or less restrictive as to what can be done. In other words, some of the licenses, like GPL, you have to return all the code for everything as least if you distribute it. I mean, if I, I can do anything I want and keep the program for myself, but if I distribute it, I have to give the code back. There are some of the licenses where that's really not entirely true. It's so, not true at all. It's yeah. 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 So you do want to be a little careful about how you get, if you talk somebody into releasing it, how that happens. And obviously, you may not have any say over that. They may dictate. Yeah. It, I'll do it, but I will only do it this way. Well, there's a lot of licenses that also say, and these are sort of always two specific licenses, that you know it's open, you may freely use this in the source, unless you're a commercial user. Yeah, yeah. Or, but that doesn't, doesn't that fall one, on the open source uh, specification. Yeah, but I mean, if he says that, it's not open source. Do stuff, okay. If he says that, it's only it's sharing the source code, but yeah. not open source. Yeah. Yeah, but, but yeah. So, just just a point to keep it. Is, um, uh, is Mozilla an example of that second case there now? Because the stuff was all stripped out, right? The uh, for, for, for Firefox, the OS2 specific code is now gone. I, I actually, I, I've heard that. I don't know the specific truth to that. Um, depending on how you keep your, it's not gone in the sense that we still have it. Yeah. I understand that, but it's not a... But you have to, it's, it's, it may not be in the main trunk of, of the Mozilla, but as long as, you're, as long as you're following the code, it's relatively easy to patch it back in. Uh -huh. it's, if, if you waited 10 versions and tried to patch it back in, so much would have changed, it'd probably be next to impossible. But you can, if you keep moving up, so the code still is there. So those I don't guys, know that it's in the trunk. Like, are those guys, there's the Mozilla repository, so they, they what's that company that does this now, Bitwise? Just, yeah. They do that, they, they pull from there, but they can't check back in, and then they have their own repository, well, and they have to merge them, or what happens? Wrong word. Not that they can't check in, it's just that the Mozilla folks don't want it. <laughs> well, yeah. whatever, but. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, but there's a difference. There's a difference in fact. Well, and the truth is, is they probably could check in if they were to fix some common code problem. In other words, that's they, probably true too. You know, they probably if they if they fixed part of the, you know, the engine or something that was independent of OS two, they probably could check it back here. <clears throat> but only and, that fix, but only the common fix. Right. They could yeah. under the hood move back in all the OS two fixes. Yeah, and then and you might be able to get away with that too. So. I really don't know the truth of the yeah. politics of that, so it, I, it would all be speculation on my part to say what's what they can and cannot check in, and what has and has not been taken out. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you may or may not be able to commit the specific OS2 code back to their trunk code to the to the main SVN or whatever it's on. Well, it stands right now just technically. We have no one that's OS2 based that has commit limits. Yeah. So, you know, not, the only thing you can do is put a bug in, supply the patch and all that, and then let it go through the review process. But it's a known fact that if you supply the patch and it's got OS2 specific 
code in it, it won't survive the review process. So it will not get checked in. But that actually, but the reality is that goes for every other piece of patch code that goes into Mozilla. It's got to go through an engineer. And it's more than just black code. It's style, function, test case, all of that stuff. It just so happens that they don't want to uh, have to pay for the resources of supporting minor platforms. And we're not the only one. And it's the same reason that SteamMonkey is no longer a, a part of Mozilla Foundation project, nor is Thunderbird. Now that they provide some support in giving them repositories, but it's really their job, the SteamMonkey and Thunderbird Porter's job, to make sure maintain compatibility. But it's an easier job for them because they're only doing it for Windows and Linux. Some ports are, have been, now I'm talking about old programs that were ported long ago, were ported as EMX, and um, you want to know that because if you try to build them with Zlib, it doesn't work because uh, depending on how the libraries were built and everything like that, the naming conventions aren't the same. So you need to make sure you're aware of that. Is, what, what is EMX exactly? Is that, first of all, is there source code for that project? Yeah, I think there is. Well, sure, there is somewhere. <laughs> Whether it's open or not, I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't everybody know what EMX stands for? No. It's but somebody's it's name. It's Emhard Maddie's extensions. Yeah. And, and what it is, is it's just an extension to OS2 that allows no, essentially... Well, it's, extension, no, it's extensions to the GCC compiler, so it runs up to it does OS2. Right. So one, you can use it to build an OS2 application. One question, something that we got confused in the last year, years. For the very new GCC versions, do you still need the MX or is this no. completely no, replaced? No, no. And it's, it's and it's even better than that. It's probably incompatible. Like he, as he found, with, which is one of the reasons he did his EMX installer, was to prevent breaking GCC. Because well, some of the DLLs have the same name. Uh -huh. And did, when did EMX go away in the GCC? It, it, well, in terms of what was, what do you, relative to what? EMX? You said, you just said you don't need EMX to use the newest compiler. When did that become true? It was, that was, was always true. Three, it was three, five, three, five, three, five, five, the only three, one used it. No, three, nobody? Three, three, okay. two, yeah. three, 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 two, two, two was the first version that had the C lib. In other words, that made EMX superfluous. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, that's yeah, C lib, okay. the same thing as yeah, yeah, C lib is, is in the yeah. sense the same okay. as EMX. Yeah. Okay. You mean live C? Yeah. No, technically it's K live C because he's the guy who wrote it, but everybody else calls it lib C. Generally, you drop the K for some reason because it's the name of the DLL too. You yeah. know, that provides all the stuff that was required in EMX. Or well, it right. replaces it's what right. EMX provided. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Not and all it, of it because some of the stuff like the, some of the stuff like the compiler, maker library, and all that sort of stuff <coughs> comes out of uh, GCC. And there are still EMX components that will work, like if you need imported libraries and all that. You still need to use the EMX. Import library tool for certain things, not everything, but for certain things. So it's something you have to use the uh, replacement that KLIBC or GCC provides. And if you look at the if you look at the source code of the KLIBC, you'll also see that there's an EMX portion where he brought some of that in. Mm -hmm. So that's right. Yeah. So that's three two two. No. Well, three two two is the first version that Newt ported over. And, you know, the 321, like I was talking about earlier in that day, that was the last version that was pre k Right, that had like the EMX news directory tree and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So the example I give is um, Darwin O'Connor's MMOS2 plugins, the MP3 and et cetera. Those were all done in EMX originally. And so MP3, the plugin is all, has always been broken. It will claim any file you point it at, it can handle. <laughs> and obviously that's not the way MMOS2 is supposed to work. So that bothered me when I was fixing Image, which is one of Mark Kimes' old utilities. And so I went to fix it. Well, of course, if you try to build it with 
GCC, modern GCC, it doesn't work very well. So I had to go out and find the libs that were actually built with GCC instead of EMX. The old ones were EMX and the new ones were GCC. And then I found out what backward compatibility means to Linux. Now, MP3 actually worked when I finally found the right lib, but it's only moved up a tenth of a point anyways. FLAC has been rewritten to the point that all the function names are different. And uh, there's a short readme that says, we did this, figure it out on your own from the header files. <laughs> uh, for Bobius, they split one lib into four. And of course, 10 years later, there's no concurrent documentation. I mean, had Dave Yeo not known what had happened, I would still not know why they didn't build. <laughs> and I've got two out of three of them built now. And the other piece with all the porting is the QT ports. We've got a pretty good QT version right now that works with a lot of things. But it also, if you go to version 5, is not backward compatible. So, or forward compatible, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, and just my observation, if you're going to write something from scratch, we really don't need another command in jail. <laughs> so you might want to start somewhere else. We're not competing with units. Tell Dave to build that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, reason, the reason that I see for writing something from scratch is to replace components of the system. In other words, you really don't need to write a word processor from scratch. You really don't need to write a text editor from scratch. There, there are ones out there that you've got a good core to start from. But New View is an example of something that there really wasn't anything out there because the only other one was Old View, which was part of the system. Um, WPI, IPFC is um, it's the IPF compiler from OpenWatcom, which by the way, you have to go out to and compile or ask one of us to give to you because it's never been released. But if somebody wants it, just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send you. And you do want the newest one because uh, some of the old ones are broken. Um, and then things like drivers and reverse engineering drivers, which is really fun. <laughs> What about development tools? Like, not that so many of us are capable of doing this kind of stuff, but like, you know, Smelly, for example. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay. thing you're going to want to have is a versioning tools because you have to get the source code somehow and while you can download the zip files this is a lot easier because it's it's going to keep track of your changes relative to the originals and it's going to get you a way to get any other changes that someone else might put up there uh, CBS, SVN, Git are the most common, Mercurial, there's a whole bunch of them. But what, you're, what you want is a tool for the project you picked. Whatever it's in, yeah. you're not going to convince somebody to take it out of an SVN and put it in Git if it's already in the SVN. Now we don't have smart Git, really, do we? Yeah, we do. We do? Mm -hmm. okay. They all have a smart version. The smart version of smart Git is, is like 2.18. Oh, well, so if you go back far enough, if, uh, okay. yeah, 
Uh, okay. All of, the, all of them might found one. In fact, you may actually get one that's a little farther advanced than 2.18 if you're willing to go in and hack the warning for that you've got a, an old version of the command line. Oh, yet. okay. I know that. I know how to hack that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, they're all older versions. But that should be a non problem because now we have a new git. Well, it doesn't read the version number right. It oh. still tell it still tells you you have an old version of Git. Uh, in other words, you you with, just have to go in and hack the check. Is that even with uh, Dimitri's last book's recent build? Yeah. Oh, okay. I well, I I think that's the one I have, but it, but it's just it's clear to me that you know because I type version and yeah it says it's version I don't remember well, what it is but whatever it is and this still gives me the error that the version is, which in truth. Uh, maybe that the version doesn't make any sense to it because it has a range or something. And so it's too high a version in reality. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, all of them take a little work. You have to have Java 6 installed, and all of them check because they are supposed to only run with Sun Java. Yeah. However, they, they were gracious enough to put in a command switch that you can put in the CMD file that overrides that so that it will work. This is only if you want to use the Java stuff to. Yeah. No. Right. Yeah. The well, the, 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 this, the regular clients, you don't need any yeah. of this stuff. You right. No, if, you if, if you just get the SVN EXE or yeah. Git EXE, yeah. yeah, you don't need that. It's just that these these make a nice GUI and they are, they're nice to manage. There's a follow up company who bought this uh, SVN stuff. And they're still producing new versions. The one problem is that they're, they're all based on SWT. Yeah. We yeah. don't have yeah. the SWT library. Well, there's a project underway to fix that. Yeah, but that's that's the reason all of them got switched to SWT and we don't have the library. So that's why that's why we're plateaued at a certain place. You can buy a professional version of this, which unlocks some additional features. I've never really seen the need. Uh, the only thing that it's meant to me is there is a very rare something that I have to do where I have to actually break down and use the command line utility. But it's, I, in other words, you're not really getting any support because you're back level so far. The command line's not so bad, by the way. You make it sound awful. I use it all the time at work. It's, like it's a matter of how you think. You just have to learn how to use it. Right. No, there's yeah. a, I understand. I'm not, I'm not telling anybody there's anything wrong with the command line versions. If that's what you prefer. This happens to be what I prefer, but, yeah, but, but I, I know there's nothing wrong. But you have to say that this uh, client has merging features in some yeah, sure. stuff built on top of the naked SVN, so yeah, yeah. It's, it, it helps. For me, it helps. <laughs> Yeah, and especially for someone that's that's somewhat new to this sort of stuff, it's it's you don't like merging source code by now. Yeah, right. I guess I, okay. Compilers. We basically have two. We have OpenWatcom and GCC. Well, for C compilers. Yeah, C compilers. That's what I'm. Doing. I'm sorry. I only do C. <laughs> and there are. You need your flexibility. Yeah, and obviously VAC is still usable. There's still a lot of there are still projects out there that are VAC. A lot of all those, probably the majority of those old orphan projects that are out there are VAC or even CSET. Um, yeah, we don't have too much stuff in CSET. Commercial stuff, yes, but yeah. not you know the stuff that our end users use. I think most. The vast majority of that these days is actually GCC. For GCC, pay the 10 euros to Paul, download his environment, and install it. Don't try to reinvent the wheel on your own. That's just my advice. You know, you can do whatever, but, but it's reasonably complete. It's got, you know, um, command files to set up the environment, everything like that. And it's got parts that he's found they work together. That way, you really don't have to worry about that you've got the wrong version of Perl or you've got whatever. But these particular pieces have been shown to work together. And you, know, you may want to tinker with it later on your own, but I wouldn't start any place else. You have to pay to get the disk shipped, is that right? Or is that right? 
it's 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 now. ten it's ten euros. He did ship them on discs for a while because he thought that was easier. But the postage rates have gone up in Australia. So I did this relatively recently, and he he said he would send me a disc if I really wanted. And I just told him that you know I would prefer him to get the money than for mm -hmm. for the postage service to get the money. So I just downloaded it. Now when he when he comes out with a new GCC, is anything inside of that that's required to make it run on OS2 kind of always stay the same? And he's just recompiling the latest version of the order? What happens there? Do you, do you know, or? What you can do with it is, um, the, way, the way that his disk is set up, there is, I think there were eight versions of GCC on it, um, something like that, the one that he gave, gave to me had eight versions of it, and then a command file for each one, and so each one of those was in a GCC directory that had its number following it. So if a new GCC comes out, I can simply unzip it into yet another directory with its number, and either modify one of the existing command files or make a new command file that just points to that directory. We almost always ship the command file. That's yeah. Well, but I'm just saying. Using his environment, he basically can unzip the new GCC right into that right. environment because that's where it came from. Yeah, there's just yeah. enough to get it to work, usually. Yeah, well, yeah, the assumption is it, you have a working environment and you're just adding, the, you're just basically upgrading the compiler. Yeah. The only thing I found from his was there were a couple of the command files weren't quite right. In other words, he had changed something after. 4.52 had been done and he forgot to change that command file to put the right Perl version or something like that. But they were basically really pretty good and obviously <coughs> the other problem with them, you want to install it to a U drive if you have the yeah. option at all. It's just much, much simpler. I would recommend not installing it anywhere else but the U drive. You know? yeah. Because the problem is once you do that you have to understand what you need to change. Yeah. But and then the only other things you need to change is like it's got the the path to open Watcom to Watcom because it uses the Watcom linker and um, things like that, which in your case may be different than what is in it. So you have to you have to scan through and make sure that also the toolkit directory was the those were the two things I had to change was the toolkit directory and the open Watcom directory, which is pretty seamless. Why do you need so many different versions? I didn't. He he's he just, just gave, I mean, he gave me his environment. He's developing those. He's he's working on actively working on them and I think runs his comparison and he considers some of them stable and not. There's actually a reason for it. I okay. The bleeding edge G C C is usually better, unless it doesn't work. In which case you wouldn't use the older one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that app is known to work for that application that you were building. We use it <coughs> for PML because it will compile under it normally. Yeah. Uh, and the new version, so yeah, yeah. Older yeah. Version yeah. Now, at some point in time, someone will actually go look and figure out why it doesn't compile and really yeah. fix GCC or fix PML. We should but, fix you know, PML, but, but it's, it's a lot of time. <laughs> okay. no. It's our yeah. fault. But, and yeah. like I said, I just got it down. Yeah. I didn't, I specifically didn't have a reason yeah. that I had all of them except that that's what. That's what I downloaded, and I was too lazy to also, delete it. Also, on Linux, you always install with, you know, like the version numbers are embedded <laughs> in what you put it into, and then you create those soft links to that place, so you can use the same name all the time with an OST. Right, but that's so. just for, yeah, you can do the same, you can pretty much do the same thing, because I have a GCC dev script that I've uh -huh. written, and it knows how to find the latest, greatest GCC, unless I override it, and it sets up the environment just perfectly in that command line session and does everything else it needs to make you be able to do that stuff. All scripts are a little more naive. It's just the way you write something. You know? And the same with this. You are really getting a copy of this U drive. Right? Yeah. And it may even have a couple backup files on it. They may have files with tilde on the end because it didn't clean up. Yeah, they have that's true. He never uses anymore because what he's, he's giving you what he says he's giving you. He's not giving you a commercial distribution of anything. Yeah. He's giving you what he's built that works. Yeah, and it, and it works quite well. 
We're giving you his build environment. Yeah. He really needs it. Yeah. Not necessarily if it works. The works part is you never know for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, well, but it does. What works works. Let's leave it at that. The, um, <laughs> one just no because uh, the the when you open his uh, command files to set up the environment. Uh, you will occasionally get the error message that there was a line that was too long. In other words, my live path plus his live path equals something that doesn't fit because it's over uh, 2048. Um, you have to remember what's being truncated is whatever was right on the end of your live path. So you have, if, if it's... It may not matter. Well, that's what I'm, that was what I was going to say, is in most cases it probably doesn't matter. If you're really afraid that it matters, just go into either yours or his and get rid of stuff that you, I mean, there's, there's live paths in there for stuff that I wouldn't even know what it was for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You'll find out. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> but, uh, but no, they're for, um, they're for what is clearly multimedia stuff and things like that where I would at least at that moment wouldn't have any use for them. So, so basically my first advice would be is if it happens just ignore it unless something doesn't work. Yeah like you've got like a truncated OS to DRL. And that's the one in the back. Yeah, but you know, hey, who needed it? <laughs> and that um, doesn't matter anyhow because you begin like that. Also, what's up with Wacom? It seems to have kind of died. Is it just Wacom has been forked. That's what I was going to talk about. It is actually so we're Yuri. <laughs> well, the 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 2.0 release from the fork is still has the OS2 installer and everything like that. Now, rather, it just happens that when he hit build, that's what comes out, and he doesn't care. Or rather, it's been you know tested and et cetera, et cetera. That we're not sure about. Um, and some of the, the leading edge code for OS2 is actually in the original. It's the code that you did, and I don't know if that's been pulled over to you. Uh, well, what he does is he pulls regularly, but based on what I saw in his GitHub, he pulls in the purpose process and he does purpose to get course and I'm thinking he probably merge it, but whether he does people merge or, or full on merge. But basically the problem with working watch now is the original developers have pretty much all gone away. We're doing other things. And you know Jerry drove a couple of them away because of the writes clunky code until you fix it. The code's good, but it always takes two or three bucks before it actually works right. And certain people have less patience with that than others. And uh, you know, he's off doing his own thing. He seems happy. I haven't actually tried this stuff yet because basically, as I, as he mentioned, I need the leading edge stuff. And we needed the ability to do debug data for for my product builds. So you know, it doesn't. And he may have pulled that in. He may not. Have. Yeah, and the, the high memory stuff in the linker. What? The high memory yeah, stuff in the linker. The, linker and all that, yeah. well, the, the, the patch was there, but that patch was not good enough. Because what I did is I tore that out and I actually put in uh, high memory malware support with a little bit of control. Sim along the lines of what 5C does, but not as fully featured because I didn't need it. Hmm. So the programming part is easy. Once you once you have your environment set up, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> compiling is good. You download the code, and if it's GCC, you run one of Paul's scripts, whichever whichever one of the compilers you want to try first, and then you either type make, w make, or n make, depending on which compiler you're using. Does C make work on OS2? Probably. There is a version. Uh, there are I would say there are projects required to make. Uh -huh. Yeah, and what compiler, like that has knowledge of the details of compilers and stuff, right? Yeah, it understands GCC. Yeah, uh, Paul, has a, Paul has a CMake distribution for the things that ports that require CMake. Okay. And those are probably all going to be GCC. Yeah. There's no one but IBM folks in this visual age. I mean, they don't use it anymore. 
But it seems um, like all the visual aid tool chain stuff has died. But you have to understand, even when I'm using GCC, the first command I type is WMake. It doesn't work very well, but <laughs> but that's yeah. just my habit because I use Wacom pretty you know, much exclusively. I, I, do so, I do that so often I built myself an M.Dot command script. But sort of you, 98% of the time, without help, can figure out whether I need WMake, which one. <laughs> but, um, one of the other things is if you're trying to use Open Wacom to build these programs that still are VAC originally, a lot of times if you use the Dash M switch, they'll build or at least come pretty close to building. Until so they hit the link stage. It's, oh, it's MS. Yes, I, yeah, I, I can't type either. Sorry. And then you fix the compiler errors. You mean the better to run? <laughs> no, no, it won't run. But then, but then you're at the point where you you can start working well, on it. We worked on moved on to the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> of course, compiles no errors. If it compiles with no errors, testing is complete. <laughs> and then obviously you're gonna need some scripting languages and some basic understanding of scripting for mo anything that's some of the smallest projects because they're going to use some of these sorts of things. Those are the ones that come to mind. I, there are probably 10,000 others. So if he has a Perl, why, why are you doing Perl? This is out of date. I don't think Paul really wants to do Perl. I think he, that was something required for what he wanted to do. So he ported it as far as he needed it, and that's that. Um, yeah. So there are certain fund if you do if you are a Perl programmer, there's fundamental things about the existing Perl codes that just don't work. Right. Yeah. And they, similar to what I did with RC, Paul actually did the first RC and custom ports and stuff like that. And when I started using RC, I said, wait a minute, this is not really close to native enough for me. So I actually the port I do is both aren't fully compatible, but it also does enough of the OS2 native stuff so that people won't quite uh, get bit by it. it. Understands forward slash, backslash, it's all that sort of stuff. It knows how to back up OS2 uh, permissions, the OS2 attributes. So you actually, and the, the extended attributes were there, and the, but they use a little bit of work, so you know, it's a different type of port. And the original Perl ports we had back in the days when uh, Ilya. Ilya was doing it. Those were the last ones, I think, that probably right. worked. They were very good OS2 functionality. We understood extent back use, yes, all of this stuff. And, of, and that's just suffered a lot of bit line in the latest ports because no one cared. But not <laughs> So I like Perl. With um, with Paul's development environment, you get all of the basic, obviously Rex comes with the operating system, but you get all the scripting languages that are commonly used in things. I'm sure that eventually if you port enough things, you'll find, you'll find one that requires something that isn't it, there. But. Do you know if anybody's ever tried to port that newer Rex? You know, open object. Oh, people have tried, people have failed. I know there's I know yeah. three, 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 three separate yeah. objects that are reported very well. Three separate, three separate, three separate, three separate, three separate, three separate, three separate and two of them were going on at the same time. One was trying to do it in the back. Another was trying to do it in something wide company. They were both, they were both doing it concurrently. I tried to do it in GCC, but I don't get very far into it. It's something I like. I don't know what to do with this. I still haven't figured it out. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I would assist, if someone actually did most of the work, I would assist taking getting <coughs> an object that was working that would actually give us the proper integration. Because that code is not there and that sort of has to be uh, re implemented. You mean but, the thing to make it work like, like the one that comes with it does? Well, yeah, the thing yeah. where it basically it integrates with the shells. And the API for that is fine. It's really not that, it's just a matter of implementing. And maybe if we ask really nicely, someone who actually has the source might give it to us. Don't know for sure, but you know, maybe, maybe Colin Shaw, you know, has enough rights to do that stuff and we'll do it. And also, the original uh, object rights developer is still the guy who's doing the vast majority of the work. And I'm sure.
sure you read that through. Because I think he was responsible for the OC more than the other effects too. It's just, again, interest. They weren't interested in maintaining it because they didn't have the ability to test it because none of their people that were core developers were using OS2. Well, actually, the problem was is IBM would not release. I remember I uh, talked to Chip, Dave, Chip, Chip Davis that was last night. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, he, uh, when I was talking to him about it at the time, IBM would not give this OS2 source code. Yeah, but maybe times have changed. And also, right now, we have one of the core developers for Open Object Direct. It's not Chip. I forget if it's Gray. They will come to me. I don't know, I just kind of skim that list. But he's the guy that tells everybody what's in the internals. And my understanding is, you know, he may have it. So, you know, it can't hurt to ask again. Yeah. But the point is, it doesn't pay to ask unless somebody's going to actually follow through and do the bills. But we can fairly easily get a command line version without the integration. That works right. So, you know, any of the other Java directs or something like that. That's just a matter of getting the compiler out of time. Stubbing out all the stuff that is Windows specific with GUI and all that. And there's some benefit to that because we would end up with a faster directory with the nice object right features. Okay, I'll, I'll continue with a little understatement. <laughs> I shouldn't even say that. It's more like I once heard there was a programmer who did some documentation. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't the code speak for itself? <laughs> if you can't read the code, you shouldn't be messing with it. <laughs> the other problem is, that for, for, for FM2, for example, I'll occasionally get an email from somebody asking me how to use such and such. And it's really kind of shocking, because I didn't know that it was in the program. <laughs> it's like, <Yeah>. what? <laughs> now, and I'll have to go dig through and actually find it. To, to to figure out, okay, is it here? Did it really ever get implemented? And is it just a menu choice? Well, well it's not only that. Don't forget, when we got the code for that, we were two versions. Yeah. So, I mean, some of the stuff was there, but not there. Yeah, and we still haven't figured out entirely what code was going out and what code was coming in. We've still got some of it just commented out. Documentation is best done by somebody who uses the program, not by somebody who writes the program. Um, because they can, they understand what they finally learn by playing around with the program. Um, that, this is all excellent observations. You know, one thing that I would add to that though is that the users, let's say you've got a user who's interested in developing documentation. He also has to have the, uh, the programmer work with him sometimes to clarify what's going on, you know, so it, it really needs to be a, a well, cooperative effort. Yeah, I, I think that's true, but I'd be yeah. much happier proofreading somebody else's documentation <laughs> for FM2 than writing it. Yeah, that's true, <laughs> that's true. But there's so, also doing documentation you have to know the profession works. You have to take that program and actually run it through its paces and not worry about the fact that it may not do what you think it should do all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Does it do what you think it should do all the time? And um, the corollary to that, too, is programmers, you can never anticipate exactly how your program users are going to use your code. Yeah. So yeah. Which is what, what crashes some code. code. They will do things that you never expect to do. Yeah. Um, that field doesn't take a dash, really. <laughs> no. So um, WPIFC is the, the new IFP compiler. And the real advantage to it at this point in time, I don't think it does anything over what the IBM one does inherently. But it can be fixed, whereas the old one cannot. Uh, extensively more capacity than the old one. That's true. Yeah. yeah that, that is the one thing. It'll it take a bigger it file. It's different bugs. Yeah. <laughs> Clearly. Except and less. Um, Viper Help is available on Hobbs, and it's a reasonable tool for converting either text files or HTML to IPF file format if you want to make standard OS2 new view style 
yeah. help files. There's also some other conversion tools for converting a couple of other formats, which work uh, to varying degrees. But I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> So, other things that you need to look at is um, installers, warp in, of course, is the classic one. Yum RPM, since I knew nothing about it other than to mention it, that's all I'm going to say. Um, but this is one of the areas where developers also fall down pretty badly, generally, is that, you know, it's really sort of beyond my scope to put the files in a zip file. And, and you really want me to do a warp it? Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, the reality is there are, there are tasks that can be done by an end user, but they take a lot of work. Yeah. How much time John's up mm -hmm. getting the work in right? And then even getting the release tool right. Well, and, and what's great about that is I've stolen the release tool and I've used it for two other projects. Yeah. It actually works very well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was not a trivial task. Oh, no. It took him a long time and a lot of work. And that's the last thing. If we have people out there who are simply building the code and trying it, that helps it goes a long way to prevent us from releasing something that has a really, really glaring defect in it that was something we just didn't drive. Like USB on 2.2? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's like, um, you know, I, John particularly has done a real good job for us on FM2. Um, things like, uh, we get this odd um, double three error message if you um, click on the name of something and edit it in the container. You then, when you empty the container, get this double three message, which I think I finally fixed. But um, but that was something that since neither of us edited file names that way, neither of us had the faintest idea it happened. Do you need someone to document that you shouldn't change file names using that kind? <laughs> I, maybe I should have had John do that instead of that. <laughs> no, we're perfectly willing to try to fix the interesting problems, but if we don't know they exist... Yeah, it, 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 I'm fine trying to fix it, but I can't fix it. That's it, you can't fix what you don't know. I won't say that's 100% true. We actually do see things that are wrong in the code every now and then, looking at other errors, looking at other things. It's just a work right to fix it. But when you deal with a lot of code, the chances of actually seeing everything is minimal. Okay. Text editors. Everyone has their favorite. Um, oh. EPM is yeah, out. One thing for EPM, if you're going to do documentation, EPM does have an HTML plugin. And I think it has a plugin to do that Yeah. Well, it has the package on NetLabs, which has the, you know, the code marking and uh, coloration and stuff like that. The problem is, is the core the core doesn't have we don't have source code to. Yeah. And so if there's any core bugs you can't fix it. FTE is up on the, up on Hobbs. In fact I did the last update of FTE about three years ago. Um, I switched over to EFTE after it got forked and um, I extensively updated it, but never gotten around to releasing yeah, you need it. someone to do an installer and documentation, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I did, I, I find, I kind of did both of those. For documentation, I ripped the HTML off of the FTE website, and of course it's not accurate, but it's better than nothing. I did try to fix it. I made some feeble attempt to fix it, and that's one of the projects that I, um, ripped off the release tool for it. So I actually I actually have the warp in built, but I'm still I'm still trying to figure out the best way to do the configuration files because um, the problem with it is you can go in and the the configuration files are just text files. And you can go in and edit them. You're not supposed to, you're supposed to 
edit a separate file which won't get overwritten, but I still haven't figured out the best way to prevent my simply overwriting people's um, well, diligent changes. Yeah, unfortunately, probably what you're going to need is a bit of rest to do a match merge. Yeah, and that's, that, that hasn't happened. If anybody wants to try EFT, if you want to email me, I'll send I'll send people copies of what I currently have. Or you can go out to SVN and pull a code and build it. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> That's a text. And I'll even, if you build it and fix something, I'll even let you. I'll even give you commit privileges. <laughs> That's a text user interface. That no. FT. Oh. No, it's a it's a uh, there's a PM there's a PM and there's a VIO version. And I use the PM version, so the VIO version maybe doesn't run anymore. I wouldn't know. <laughs> I, do, I do occasionally fire it up to at least prove it will run, but, but I don't use it enough to be sure that I haven't broken something in it. And then you have to think of other tools, prep, set, oct. Um, can you still get to the Mozilla, Mozilla tools package? Is that, are those links Where's still the, up there? The IBM ones? Well, not the IBM supplied ones. It's it's the one that was on the page, the page that told you how to build Mozilla back when back was. And, and that page, I think, sort of got updated. So what, I mean, what you need, it's got proper links. So, yeah. And but, if not, what you do is you just post to the proper place and they'll fix it. Yeah. Yeah. But, but but that particular set of tools contain these and they contain it contains versions that yeah. seem to work reasonably right. well. The other way to look at it too is if you get Paul's build environment, I think you'll get all of it. You get I think you get most of them anyways. And some other things that you might um, think about. PM printf is actually quite nice for debugging, especially for debugging things like the um, L switcher plugin which it's real hard to get it to write to anything, but it writes to real nicely to this. So it's, it's something to think about for, for being able to check and debug. Um, there is a, at least one C syntax checker out on Hobbs that you can run against your code, which will point out your obvious stupid errors like, um, you know, you your index number is one too small on a <laughs> on a variable and things like that. Stuff that stuff that compilers don't catch, but that as soon as you see it, your problem is obvious. Indent is just a, a program which will clean up and reformat if you if you download one of these programs and you don't at all like the way the code is laid out. This will fix. 95% of it into whatever format you would like to have it in so that you can read the code easier. And then Accept Q is an extremely nice tool to plug into all of your anything that you happen to build because it will give you the trap information. Just make sure whoever's using it and telling you they're trapping on exit hasn't set it up to give you a trap file on exit, which you can do in configure sys. Thank you, Lewis. Uh, <laughs> but um, you mean because this won't get control if you do that? Well, no. What it does, what it does, it, it's just a report. It's telling you what the exit handler is doing, basically. Um, now, mommy, make it stop. That comes from FM2. I don't know. Did it ever get taken out of the setup? Oh, no, I, I haven't no, looked recently either. It's from Mark Kimes. And this is just a list of miscellaneous oddities I've come across. There is a drag limit in OS2. There is a 64K buffer that you can overrun. It will tell you nothing about it. And what it does is it simply hoses whatever's beyond it. And if that happens to be part of the kernel, you've really got a problem. I've, I've never overdrawn that drag limit without losing the system eventually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I might not have right there. You're going to wipe something out that yeah. you use. In containers, if you have 32,001 items and are using a mouse, the scroll wheel no longer works. Uh, it's not just, unfortunately, we are using containers. Yeah. 
and we have never got at least with FF2, we've never gotten around to re-implementing. <coughs> yeah, and then in this. Nobody needs 32,000 items in a container yes, anyways. We were, we were te I don't remember what we were yes, testing. Yes, the email and user case. Yeah. They all want 32,000 items. Yeah. Or more. High memory use. You can set things to be up in high memory. But guess what? Part of the functions don't work in high memory. Uh, I can't even remember. I can't remember any of them that don't. But but a lot of the DOS, DOS X something calls. It's, they, it's, it's documented in os 2 safe that Yeah. That's the documentation. Yeah, that's the whole documentation. But if you try to if you try to load one of your programs high and it doesn't work, you want to go figure out which ones are the DOS functions. Because what's happening is they don't thunk they don't thunk, so whatever's in the memory which is up high doesn't get down into the 16-bit code. I mean, they don't copy. Copy. It's a little worse than dunking. Dunking yeah. would be okay. Yeah. And what's even what's even more interesting, large file and also large file support in these old programs, it's not going to be automatic except, I think it's on the next slide. Oh, no, this is the other one. Um, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, some Wacom considerations. This is the uh, win message box too. It's one of the dialog boxes, obviously, for you to pick if your answer yes, no, or whatever you might. Um, that's the button struct in um, Open Whatcom. <laughs> that's the button struct in the IBM toolkit. Now, guess what happens if you just put the variables followed by commas? It doesn't work. <laughs> because obviously that second little piece that they put in for the, the pack byte is now giving the ID for the button. So uh, that took me a while to figure that one out. It's like, because because I essentially lifted the code out of the programming guide, the IBM programming guide, but of course built it with open Whatcom. I won't guarantee that's the only time that this is going to happen. You won't find something like that. So think about things like that if something just doesn't seem right. Could you fix it with packing or packing well, they, they switch? Yeah, you could. I, I could fix it, but I I had to know what was wrong. I mean, it was easy to fix once I knew what was wrong. Yeah, but it's <laughs> not really the question. The real question is why the struck different. Yeah. Yeah. So something happened um, in uh, the translation. Maybe uh, you know someone else built their own into the struct because you gotta remember you can't do the open Wacom headers have to come from public sources. They can't come from somebody copying the toolkit and taking the license code out. It was actually changed. Because uh, at the time we were looking at it, someone actually changed the code in open Yeah. They, they actually changed it. If I ever get the urge, I'll we'll find out who did it. It's actually easy enough to do. I knew who did it at the time. I don't remember now. Okay. Who did it? I, so, so I don't remember now. I saw it at the time. I saw who did it. It was, was it one of the four developers? Or? It was it was OS2 guy. It was one of the OS2. It was somebody on the OS, you know, the or Cafe or something like that. No, it was, and I don't know if they did it. I don't know if they checked it in, but they they were the ones that put the you know the, the ticket bug in for it. Uh, Yuri or I don't remember. Yuri? No, well, Yuri is not really an IBM guy. No, I didn't say IBM OS2. OS2. No. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it obviously would be because that structure has no meaning to anybody but OS2. Yeah. It was it was somebody that put that actually. Was it young? I put the ticket in this to report it. Yeah, no, but I'm thinking, was it, it might have been Young with some of his stuff that had requested that change. <laughs> but, <laughs> was this to be it? So, one of, the, one of the things to be aware of if you're building with the newest Open Whatcom is that it is implemented all the large file support. In other words, the command open now calls down to DOS open L, not just DOS open. What that also means, though, is that simply by switching to this compute, this compiler, one of the L, one of those L functions, 
breaks high memory because it doesn't work for high memory. So if you suddenly have high memory broken and you switch to this compiler, that's what you want to look for. Is it's 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 one of the open that with this port? That's your employee. No, no, this is this is R2O. Well. This is if you build I'm talking about building off the main trunk. You get that effect. Well, no, it doesn't default to high. What I'm saying is if you have a program that loads high that you build with this and it suddenly breaks it, that's what broke it, is the fact that they've changed, they've changed a large file support in the things like open, copy, move, now uses the, the L functions instead of just the blank, like, they use DOS open L instead of DOS open. Yes, it does. No, this is not Jerry's. This is open Wacom. No, this is open Wacom. But the, but, the, but the problem is not in the Wacom library. The problem is in the real OS2 no, function. No, no, it's well, it's the, the, problem, the problem for this is in the real OS2 function. Yeah. It's just that the library happens to use yeah, it, yeah. which would leave you going, what happened? <laughs> I did that, by the way. That's, that's how I know this. <laughs> I don't believe you, I just am surprised because I don't recall seeing that. WIPF, the, it couldn't handle these. That was yeah, the that was the one where, where it deleted the yeah, deleted the function or the, the variable for reasons yeah, that we never I, could I, figure I out. For that one to fix it. But there is a fix, but the point being is you want to you want to use the very latest code or this sort of thing is broken. Which is not released. Well, the, it's not released at all. But it's available. It's available. <laughs> and and WIPF, uh, there should be a C on the end, um, does it wrap in tables. That, did you ever mention that to uh, not Jim, you guys doing the uh, I think I emailed him. I think I emailed him at one point with it and asked him. I don't. What I would recommend to do is put something in the book so I can email him again. Yeah. Because that he should be able to fix. And then there's also as WRC was it in one nine? I believe so. Yeah, because that's the resource compiler for the open Montreal. My comment earlier about accept you. It's amazing how we always focus on our most recent defects. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the other things that need to be He's done, which, which you really are going to have trouble getting me to do, is things like this bug ticket management, milestone planning, documentation. So these are things you can get involved in and don't have to be a programmer at all. You just have to be able to edit a wiki. You just have to be able to be willing to deal with a programmer. <laughs> we're, 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 not, we're not that evil. Which website are you talking about? These are like FM2's website. Okay. In other words, there's a bunch of things that when I do a release, I have to go up on the website and change the release numbers and move tickets to the next um, milestone and all that kind of stuff. Closing the stale ones. Now, just having somebody go in there a month and looking for the ones that haven't had feedback for a month and marking the stuff. Yeah, resolution unknown, no feedback. And then in bigger projects, um, you need even more types of stuff. Um, in other words, it's, some of these things aren't that important if you've got one developer. <laughs> because they're going to do what they want anyways. <laughs> but um, these are just things to think about when you're doing bigger projects or involved in bigger projects. And it compiled without error. It's got to work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and the two features that I use work fine. <laughs> now the other 26, who knows? <laughs> Questions? Well, thank you very much.